Good morning, church. There are some things that real men should never be caught doing. But there are other things that's quite acceptable. For instance, I love to watch an old car being restored on TV. I feel, I feel quite comfortable. But every now and then I'll come in from counseling or teaching and Dawin will be in a program and will be finishing up. And then I'll sit down, and because she watches all the programs I like to watch, I'll sit down and watch this program, something about a dress. You shouldn't be caught watching that if you're a man. And then there's another one about transformation. And that also you don't want to be caught doing. But I was intrigued. Just about a week ago, came in, and she said, watch this. And here is this mother. She's in her early 30s. She has a daughter who is in about 12, you know, 11, 12 years old, and this daughter is embarrassed about the way her mother dresses, and really, that mother was dressing real bad. Her makeup was awful. I mean, you could hardly see who she was underneath all of that, and there's this lady that's a specialist in transformation. The first thing she does is take that makeup off. And then she has various outfits uh, planned, and this lady comes back in these different outfits, and it's amazing to see her reaction. She's starting to look more like the type of person that a mother of an 11, 12-year-old child would look like, and less like a streetwalker, because really, she did. That's what she looked like. She looked really bad. And um, she, she puts on these uniforms, but I thought she would be happy, but she's not. This lady started to cry because the outside didn't match the inside. And even though at the end of the day, the daughter puts her arms around and says, Mom, I'm so proud of you. And they interview people on the street and say, What do you think about this lady? And most say that they won't run from her now. They'd probably want to visit with her. And, and it comes all positive. I get the feeling that she's probably going to go back to the way she was because the transformation didn't start on the inside. And it reminded me of 1 Samuel 16, verses 6 and 7. Samuel is very upset. Saul is king, and God has said, I don't want Saul anymore. And God says to Samuel, get over it and go to Bethlehem and and go and anoint a new king for me. And he he comes into the city, and and, and all of David's sons are standing there so proud, and they get marched in front of him one at a time. The first one is Eliab. Boy, he looks just the part, and, 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 and Samuel is saying to himself, surely this is the one, in verse 6. But look at what God says in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on his height or his stature, because I have rejected him. Why? For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man sees the outer appearance, but the Lord sees the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. We try to look at transformation for the new year. And so this month, as we look at uh, in September, trying to get close to God, I have taken the month of September to go through Romans chapter 12, and we're going to start with the first two verses this morning, uh, understanding that if we're going to be servants of God, which is what we want to achieve by the end of September, if we want to be the kind of people that would be God's servants, going and doing what God wants us to do, then we're going to have to start with not what we're doing on the outside, but what we're doing on the inside. We're going to have to transform two areas. Our bodies are going to have to be transformed by presenting our bodies to God. We're going to have certain prohibitions that we're going to say we're not going to follow, and then we're going to have a final product. And so it's going to start with our bodies, and then it's going to end up with our minds. And that's going to be the final product, and then we'll follow through the outline that's behind me through the rest of September. But as you can see, That's not going to make any difference if you don't start with a transformation. So today I would like you to think about what is it going to be to transform? What is it going to take? And then throughout the rest of the week, slowly take one step at a time and try to get better and better at it. We look at the first one and we see that there is something that we have to present. And so I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12 and look with me at verse 1. Look at me at verse 1, and 
While that's fluttering down, I'll hold up these and talk to you about how we as a church transformed ourselves last week. And came six ants, right? So you're going to have to take about six and, and, and give it to them. We, we, we thought about putting a postcard and stamp, but we want to make this personal. We're also looking for feedback. And so uh, if you get feedback from the, from the visitors, please let Brian know the feedback. Send him an email, send him a text, or, or, or let one of the elders know, but it's very important that we get Brian the feedback so we may know how to do better next year. But that's how we transformed as a church, on the outside. It was wonderful. But when we transform on the inside, we have to present ourselves. When I was in the military, I remember we stood at attention during boot camp, and they, they looked at us individually, and they saw if we were presented well. And then we would go on the parade field, and it would be like a whole big church, but, but a company or regiment would be spread out there, and we'd be standing for an hour, or two, or three hours without moving. And, and the general would come and inspect us, the sergeant major would have us all right, and we would march and do different movements, and then the general would come, and he would inspect us. He would see if we're presenting ourselves well. And then just before we went into war, we would have our ammunition and our kit with us, and we'd stand in a big line, and again, we would be inspected. And if we had too much water or too little water, or if we decided to take candy instead of uh, the, the meals ready to eat, or uh, anything, that we, uh, anything that wasn't meant to be on our person, we'd get thrown out. And again, we'd be presenting ourselves. And so when we come together as a church, we're presenting ourselves. When we go out, we're presenting ourselves. So this is what he's doing. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, Again, therefore means go back. Romans chapter 1 through chapter 11 is theory. And he's told us how to be saved. He's told us how to not get caught up in hedonism, judgmentalism, and legalism. Uh, he's gone through so many things. He's talked about the struggle we would have with our conscience and everything. And then he, he comes finally here and says, let's apply all of this. Let's become practical. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. He's talking to the church. And he's saying, I beg you. Haven't you wondered why, no matter how good you do, the Bible always seems to be pestering you about being better? The last verse of Matthew chapter 5 probably will give you a hint. We need to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. That's the goal. And it starts by you realizing that this is something that you do with your body. I appeal to you, therefore, therefore brothers, uh, by the mercies of God, because of what God did for us, that you present yourselves as a living sacrifice. You remember Jesus on the cross? He was, he was dying. He was alive, right? While he was dying, he was in excruciating, drawn out death. He was a living sacrifice. And then he went to be with the Father and he said to us, you do the same. We take on the death, burial, and resurrection in baptism. And we come out and we walk from that moment. And we don't immediately go to be with the Father. We walk in this world. As Jesus, as a living sacrifice. You are the thin blue line, as it were, between the God of this world, which is the devil, and the souls that he's trying to get, and those who would make it. If you are a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Holy and acceptable. Completely and that which God accepts. Now, let's talk about things that God doesn't accept as a living sacrifice. If we were to take the Lord's Supper, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 33, and we didn't wait on each other, what would we be doing? We'd be eating and drinking damnation on ourselves, right? And, and so that's how we can do it. How about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5? Let's say that we have a gift that we want to give to God. And we bring it to the altar. We lay it at the apostles' feet or, or we put it in the plate or whatever it is. And we, uh, well, let's go back to Matthew 5 first. And we have ought against our brother. What should we do with the gift? We lay it down. We go first make it right. This morning, did you take the Lord's Supper waiting for each other? This morning, did you have a problem with another brother or sister in Christ? Did you... 
Go, go ahead and let, let, leave your gift. Or with Ananias and Sapphira, they said that they would give a certain amount for the needs of the brethren, and they didn't. And they lied. To who? Peter? John? The apostles? Right? No. They lied to the Holy Spirit. That is something you really don't want to do. So let's not eat or drink damnation on ourselves. We can go back to the Old Testament. We can see bring an old, uh, a foreign incense to the offering. Uh, bring in something that God doesn't want. Uh, you know, there, there, there's ways that people collect money for different things, uh, worthy causes that the church could be involved in, but they don't do it in the way they, they should do it. They, um, they'll go and collect money from house to house or, or things like that, and, and God says to us, if you, if you want to give, you give when? The first day of the week when we all come together and read First Corinthians 16 for that. And so there's ways of doing things when it comes to worship, and it's very, 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 very dangerous to step out of these things. So when I say a, a, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, I need you to think about that. So let's think about that. Holy and acceptable to God, uh, uh, you know, th which is your spiritual worship. A spiritual worship is something that you don't just do year on Sunday, but you do it every moment of your life. You're a living sacrifice. You are the gospel written not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. So you put your body in a position where the devil can get to you. How many seconds does it take from when the devil tempts you to when you've actually decided to follow through or not with that temptation? It's five seconds. Within five seconds, you've decided. So what would happen if you put your body in a place where it shouldn't be? We're still on point number one. Let's say you put your body in a place where it shouldn't be, and the devil tempts you. What should you do? Your body is a living sacrifice, right? Holy and acceptable to God. Stop what you're doing and worship God. Go and worship God. Uh, pick up the phone, call somebody, encourage somebody, go and visit somebody, go and visit somebody who's sick, send an encouraging note to somebody who needs encouragement, and there's always people who need encouragement. Do the opposite. Uh, you, have a, you have an enemy. You're tempted to get real angry with your enemy. Drive to the Dollar General store, buy a gift, right? You've heard me say that several times. I don't mean, you know, if it's your friend, drive to Macy's and get a nice gift and your enemy drive to the Dollar General. I'm just saying, you know, just go and get something. Just bless this person because God says bless this person. So we bless them. That's what we need to do. We have people who wake up every morning and they put their bodies on the line. We call them the people of the thin blue line, right? The police, the military, the people in the fire departments. Every day they wake up and they say, I am giving my body so that you can be safe. This past week we saw an, a deputy officer in, uh, in Texas uh, by the name of Go Forth, same name as our neighbors, Go Forth, uh, was killed. And I'm thinking, you know, Yari is a person who, who every day says, I lay down my life for my friends, but also for those who are not my friends. And how much we can appreciate that. And how much we should appreciate that. But I'm thinking that's a physical war. What about the spiritual war? What about you? What about your friends who won't make it if you're not a living sacrifice? So number one, present your bodies. Number two is the prohibition. And, and this doesn't just follow on with the next verse. It doesn't just slide in. It doesn't come across a suggestion. It's absolute. Do not be conformed. Do not be conformed to this world. What is this world? Let's talk about that. I know what we're meant to be. We're meant to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. I'll tell you what the world does. The world is involved with drinking, partying, Smoking marijuana, getting involved with heroin, all those types of stuff. And we are not to be conformed to this world. Now, I'm not specifically telling you, don't do this, don't do that. I'm saying to you, this is what the Bible says, be a living sacrifice. I'm telling you what the world does. It's the opposite. And I'm saying, how are you going to regulate those? Let me just go into that a little bit. 
In the 1960s, late 60s, early 70s, many people in our communities, maybe even sitting here, experimented with marijuana. And they thought, you know, that's just to relax, get rid of a headache or migraine or whatever, uh, have a good time. And, and, and their kids now are involved with that, and they think it's the same stuff, and it's not. The stuff that you have today is highly addictive. And a lot of it can kill you. It just takes a little bit. And it comes in like liquid marijuana form. And I don't know anybody that's hooked on heroin who didn't start with marijuana. Really, it's, it is a gateway drug. And we can back it up. I know of a lady who a few months ago, actually nine months ago, decided one day that uh, it was bad to smoke. Quit smoking just like that. But now I'm thinking, you know, okay, how many temptations, how many times was this person tempted and didn't do it? And I know the only way that they could have gotten out of it is saying, I'm not going to do the things of the world. I'm not even going to talk about where the line is that I shouldn't cross. I'm just going to make myself a living sacrifice. You are the only gospel some of these people will ever, ever get. And if you're not going to stand on that line and say to them, I'm not going to go anywhere, even close to it, they won't make it. We cannot conform to this world. Scotland is where my family come from, and we've got a beautiful emblem. But it's only beautiful to Scottish people. The rest of the world thinks that they say, man, these Scottish are stupid. How did they ever come up with such a silly emblem? It's, a, 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 it's got the word in blue, Scotland, you know, nicely. You know, that looks beautiful. They really did a good job. And then they've got this emblem with two things on one side and this one big thing coming up like this. It's a thistle. They've got a thistle as their emblem. I mean, how many of you would think, okay, we've got one shot at this and we're going to put a thistle up there. But every Scottish kid knows why there's a, a, a thistle on the Scottish emblem. It was something that happened in the year 1263. The Danish people decided that they were going to come over and they were going to annihilate Scotland. And so, and so they came in and the Scottish people were all sleeping, you know, and they had all their clans together because this is, a, this is a make or break time. They're either going to be annihilated or they're going to stand. And, uh, and they were sleeping and these Danish people came in and they snuck in. And they took their shoes off and they all creeped in. And you know what a thistle is? Have you ever seen a thistle? It's got really, really sharp points. And one of the Danes stepped on this thistle and let out this blood-curdling shriek, you know, and the Scottish woke up and drove them off, you know, into the sea, back to where they needed, where they came from. And they stood fast. And they were so appreciative of the thistle that it's now the emblem. The world could look at us and say, you know what, these Christians don't conform. They just don't do things like the world would do. I mean, they look like an obnoxious thistle, maybe. And we say, you know what, that doesn't matter because God told us not to conform, but be transformed like a butterfly, like the picture that we got up there. Like a butterfly will be transformed by the renewing of your minds that by testing you might prove or discern the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. How can you transform your mind? You transform your mind by the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. This Word, according to verse 14, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. This Word we have right here in front of us, and we read and we imbibe it. This Word, even though Jesus spoke it, even though Jesus lived it, didn't come from Him, it came from the Father. And He didn't say, He didn't add or take away one word but said and did exactly what the Father told him to say and do, according to John 5, verse 19 and 29. And so we do what God says. We take his word because we know in it are the words of eternal life. These are the words that will judge us in the last days. These are the words that guide us. And these are the words that transform us and make us into the servants that we need to be. So what is the will of God? You know, that by testing, do you know that this week, If you determine to be a servant, you determine to transform your life, if you determine that you're going to be part of what we are, you know, we decided at the beginning of the year that we are going to just walk a little closer to thee. 
just a little closer to Jesus. And so it caused us to do some ridiculous things. It caused us to, 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 to finally do uh, w- w- with the CTCC. You know, we were talking about that how long, right? And then, and then Bill, you, you wanted to get us on cable. for so, And we, we did. You know, we, we were doing ridiculous things. We were going places and we were thinking about doing things that a normal church wouldn't do. A normal church stays inside the walls, pats each other on the back, hugs each other, loves each other, has nice fellowship meals. But we decided we're going to be different. We are transforming ourselves. And when we transform ourselves, we are tested. So what are you going to do this week as you're trying to find the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God? Let's say Monday and Tuesday, you you say, I'm going to be good Monday and Tuesday. And then I'm going to elevate my game on Wednesday and Thursday. I'm not going to be good. I'm going to be acceptable to God. And then uh, Friday, Saturday, I'm going to be perfect. Okay, If you're going to make that your goal, how much of the Bible will you read this week? How often will you read? Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to minister to? Your ministers of reconciliation, who are you going to bring a little bit closer? Those of you who invited guests, you've got these cards that you can, you can present to people. So that's wonderful, right? What are you going to do? Bet somebody's watching. And it's not important that your brethren are watching. It's important that you know that God is watching. There was a young man. He was going to be the first Fortune 500 president under the age of 40. So this is probably a few years ago because the tech people are now way under 40 and they CEOs and presidents of these big corporations. He was 38 years old. He'd been the vice president of this, this huge company and helped this company to do really well to get positioned right. So when promotion time came, they decided to look at him. There was an electorate board that got together just to, to, to interview and decide who the people were going to make it. They gave this person a lot of tests and this person passed all the theory. I mean, he spoke so well. They were so excited. They, before lunch, they said, yes, yes, we're going to do this. We're going to do and they were so excited, and, and they said, let's go for lunch, and we're going to talk about how we're going to do this. We're going to meet with the news media and everybody after lunch, and so, so we're going to go on our own, and this young man found that he had to go on his own to have lunch. The co- closest place was a cafeteria, and it was one of these places where you go in, you, you pick up your plate, you pick up, you tell the waitress, I want, a, I want that meat, and I want those two vegetables, and they give you, they dish it up, give it to you on a on, on, on a tray, and you go a little bit further, you choose your iced tea, a little bit further, you take two buns, and you go a little bit further, you take two pieces of butter maybe to go with it, and then you go to the tills, and they look at every item you've got, and they ring it up, and then you pay for what you, what you bought. Well, the young man didn't know that the people who had just decided to make him president were walking behind him. And they didn't decide to follow him. It was just a coincidence. And they were so excited thinking about how those guys can represent the company. And they were watching how friendly he was. How he interacted with people so smoothly. But when he came to the food, he took all the items, took the two pieces of butter, put it on his plate, and very deftly took a paper napkin, put it over the two pieces of butter. Very deliberately, no doubt in their minds as to what had just happened. They were watching it. Not just one, multiple of them saw it. He'd failed a test and wasn't even a test that they were thinking about doing. After lunch, they were so angry, and instead of promoting him, they fired him. And that's awful, isn't it? But think about the test that is happening today. There's a test going on, and at any moment, we can end up before our Heavenly Father in judgment. And all your friends and family, those closely associated with you, they can also be there. And if we don't make it, it's going to be bad. I heard somebody put on Facebook, uh, let's bring back hanging for those people killing police. And I think, wow, that's, that's, that's an awful death. That is so public. That is so shameful. And wow, to die a death like that. And then I thought, how does that compare to what's going to happen in eternity? And I thought, boy, that's so nothing. That is just a snap of the neck, and that's it. But when we die, 
and we go to be with God, either in heaven or hell, we go to a place where the worm doesn't die, where the fire is never quenched. The soul that's created never dies, but spends eternity in a place it doesn't need to be. And all we've got to do is realize what God has asked us to do. Present your bodies. Here's the prohibition. Do not be conformed. Here is the product. Being able to discern the will of God by testing you can discern it. What is the good, acceptable, and perfect will? It's a tremendous challenge, but it's a very important challenge. Just like a policeman or a fireman that wakes up every morning to walk that thin blue line, you are all there is. Literally, folks, I'm not lying to you. You all there is between heaven and hell. And all you need to do is be a servant. Be transformed like a worm transformed to a butterfly. Be transformed into the person that Jesus was when he walked in this world. Don't worry about what should we do, what should we not do, you know, do not taste, do not touch, do not handle. Things like Colossians 2 verse 21 talk about, that's not where we should be. We should be right here. I am a living sacrifice. If I can help you in any way today, if you want to start that transformation, as I said earlier on, it starts with the death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. It, it, it's you saying, this is the way to the cross, and I'm going to go to it. And if you've gone to the way of the cross, and you've been baptized, and, and you are now such an important person that you've forgotten you're actually a servant, please come back. Transform back as together we stand and sing. Evening, church. Anybody getting hot? Just join my wife over there. It's nice and cool. I can't believe the breeze. <laughs> it's nice, cool day, also. Okay. Just one down. Oh, okay. One, one air conditioner's down. So everybody, just move over that side because that side's cool. <laughs> We're looking at uh, being servants during the month of September and looking at the idea of the Lord making us into servants. And I was wondering today, what does it take to be a servant? What fancy degree do you need? What, what incredible qualification do you need to be a servant? You know, we have uh, children here, and they have tremendous faith. And oftentimes God tells us that in order to be what he wants us to be, we need to just be servants. And interesting thing happens, you know, while the lesson is being preached, uh, the children are doing this. They, they're coloring in, and I, I don't know which one, but I know it's more or less from over there. That was from this morning, this morning's project. And you'd think that they don't hear much. But I sent one of the members of the church a, a email and asked this, person to please refresh me, remind me of uh, what happened during VBS. And so this is the question. I need a refresher. Tell me about Emmeline inviting your brother and his family to church again. I believe it was during VBS. You remember how we talked about invite your friends and your family to VBS and, and we had a pretty good group? So this is what the dad says. That is right. We hadn't taken the time to invite anyone, in parentheses, got too busy, but she wanted her friend to be there with her and invited them without us knowing. We found out when our sister-in-law texted my wife before services to see what time it started. Our five-year-old took time, our five-year-old took the time, but we didn't. It was an eye-opener for us. What does it take to be a servant? It takes just being Jesus. Just be a servant. And then let your heart do the rest. You want your friend to be with you in heaven? Well, then you want your friend to be with you here. It's the same thing. Open to Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter 17, we have Jesus talking about being stumbling blocks to these little children. And then he goes on to, be, to talk about a parable of being a servant. And then he talks about a healing and who comes back and gives glory and who doesn't. In other words, how to be a servant? We need to have increased faith from him. We need to receive our, uh, he needs to then receive our service and he needs to receive our glory. In Luke 17, we read the following in verse 1. And he said to his disciples, Temptation to sin 
or temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe through the one whom it comes. And I've told you before that the word tempta or sin is not in the text. Sin is the Greek word amartia. This is not amartia. This is skandalion. This word means a trap. And so what happens is we get the ball rolling and everything's going really well. And, uh, and, and then I, I ask Jeff, I say, hey, Jeff, didn't you see all the open, park, open parking lots? And Jeff says, that's not your problem. Or, or something like, don't worry about that, right, Jeff? It's his problem. That's by word for word what you said. And, and, and I know I baited him a little bit because I was wanted to get that reaction. But it came, and I was so happy when I heard it. You see, we have these ideas. God gives us these ideas. Uh, he gives uh, the, the old men dreams and the young men visions. And, and, and he puts all these ideas in us, and then left brain comes along and pours cold water all over it. And, and that's terrible, you know. And, 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 and especially when the ideas come from God. And when we see what's happening in our congregation, we see the direction that, the, that God's taking us, we soon understand these aren't our ideas. Our ideas are pitiful. We need to have the, the ideas that a little child will have. And so he says, but woe through whom they come. Verse uh, 2, it would be better for him if a millstone was tied around his neck and that he was cast in the sea than what he would cause one of these little ones, again, not to sin, but to stumble. Verse 3, pay attention to yourselves. In other words, be very careful. You know, I, I, I'm very quick to go to Jeff and pour cold water over him. Jeff and I apologize, you know. That, be careful, Neville. Don't do that. Pay very careful. You see, if I'm a servant, then I'm not worried about what Jeff's doing in his ministry. I'm too worried about what I'm doing in my ministry. But guess what? If I'm not working in my ministry then I've got a lot of time to sit around and see what's wrong in Jeff's ministry. And that ought not to be, right? I need to be busy with what the Lord's asking me to do. Why? Because I'm a child. I'm not a boss. I'm not a super clever person. I'm just a stupid empty vessel that said, here I am, Lord, use me. And now he can because he's got my attention. I'm listening, you see. And, and now he can start speaking to me. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins or your brother causes you to, to stumble, your brother uh, uh, pours cold water in your ideas or whatever. Rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he does this, you know, if he causes the stumbling to go on seven times in, a, in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Now, why? Because, you see, as we get going with the congregation and we get the body moving and we get momentum and we're going in the right direction, we're human, which means we will make mistakes, which means we're not going to be perfect. We're going to say things and do things that we shouldn't do, and that will stop the momentum unless we forgive each other. And we, that's the quickest way. We're still not going to go as fast as what if Jesus was doing it, but at least we'll be moving forward. Let it go. Well, how do you let go of somebody seven times in one day pouring water over your ideas? How do you do that? Well, the apostles didn't know. They said, Lord, increase our faith. In Greek, it's an exclamation mark. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a mega volume coming out here. Lord, we can't do this. Increase our faith. And so what do we need is increased faith. And this is what verse 6 says. And the Lord said, if you had the faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. You know what? We've already got the faith. We've already got the faith. We already, the Lord has already given it to us. All we've got to do is look around us, see what needs to be done. My friend, I would love my friend to be. I'm just going to ask my friend. Uh, Gary, you talked about planting and watering and God giving the growth. This past week, what we've done is we've planted. Uh, Jeff, you've planted a whole bunch of grass out there on the side, right? And you put straw over it. What's the next thing that is needed? what's going to happen if we don't get water? There's cold water again, right? <laughs> don't worry about it. God will take it. No, we've got to water. In this instance, we planted the seed last week. We've got to water the seed. You want to see how quickly grass can turn really ugly? Don't put water on it. But you need to call. You need to follow up. Take that card. Tell them how much we love it. And you know, along with those cards over there, those thank you cards, there's another big index card that says this is all we're doing. 
Maybe they didn't get one last time. Take one of those too, you know. Uh, what's the next big thing we got going? We've got a family retreat. We invited them to our family day, family friends day, invited them to the family retreat. Gideon will be jumping that high if you invite, if we turn out with double the tenants. It wouldn't be great. No, let's just follow up with us. And, and that, that's the kind of idea that somebody stupid would come up with. But you know, God's ideas are ridiculous. They don't make sense to us. I've heard some really ridiculous ideas since I've come here. Most of them I kept my mouth shut. And some of them have turned out to be wonderful things. Uh, you know, I just didn't think we had the resources to do some of the things that, 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 that people came up with. And now we've got this idea of getting the whole church involved on the next finger food uh, supper. What's going to come out of that? <laughs> that's, that's pretty scary. You know, my left brain's already revolt, uh, you know, doing tumble turns here. I, I feel we're already spread out. We're already too busy. No, not, not, even, not even a little bit. One day, I had just started to preach. It was... Um, I'd been preaching for about six months in South Africa, and uh, something happened on the coast of South Africa. A Greek-owned ship uh, hit, hit ground, hit a reef, and the captain and the crew, guess what they did? They didn't tell anybody. They bailed. And there was this young couple. They were musicians from Britain, uh, the hills, uh, Moss and Tracy Hill. They'd been there, and they saw some of the drills, you know, and, and there was nobody else to, to do it, so they took over. They took leadership. They ran to the, to the radio. They radioed the South African Coast Guard, and they started to get everybody together, organized. Just like that, the, the, the Coast Guard's helicopters were out there, and they rescued these people. But yeah, we have leadership that should have worked, but they were too clever. They were too important to do the work that needed to be done. And here were these insignificant people that saw what needed to be done, and they did it. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, this little kid turns up on this battlefield, and the, and the Philistines are, are just beyond themselves with this big hero shouting insults. He turns around and says, you know what? You come to me with a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, in verse 45. Pretty soon we have the whole army on the run, because a little child saw what needed to be done. Oh, the, the, you know what the grown-ups did? They tried to put him with a big sword and a big shield, and, and he, he just put, the, he says, I haven't tested this stuff. I can't go out with this stuff. Tell you what, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just get a few rocks over there and my little sling like I always am. S silly, right? Silly. It's absolutely ridiculous. God doesn't need us to be clever. He doesn't need us to be powerful. He doesn't even need us to have the fantastic weapons. He will, he will fight the battle. He will turn the enemy against him itself. He just needs us to step out. What is the biggest international crisis that you know of right now? It's hitting every newspaper, every bulletin. Everybody's talking about it. Yes, the refugees. Syria is treating their people like dirt. What are, what are we going to do about it? Was it, it's not our problem. Well, listen, what if one of our children says, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> you know, let's just step out in faith and do what God asks us to do. In every and every circumstance, whenever we see something, let's go ahead and do it. A few years ago, well, not too long ago, uh, Benjamin left for, uh, for Northern Ireland, and uh, he took a, a few people with in a group, and there ended up to be about five of them. One is left. There's four left. And uh, I read this in last night's bulletin. I get it on a Saturday night. Our aimers will be guests at a reception on Tuesday hosted by the mayor in recognition of volunteers in the borough. They are wonderful, or are they wonderful? <laughs> Isn't that great? Uh, this is a, a place that has had a war, religious war going on. Right now, religion is being clamped down. I just read a whole big thing that was also sent to me about how they're trying to take religion out of every aspect and here are these kids saying, what can we do? Okay, we can start helping. And uh, there's a bulletin at the back that came to me this week about the different things that, they, that they've been doing on a pretty regular basis. Volunteering in so many different places. What is that all about? That's just a group of people without a fancy degree just going into a place and saying, what can we do? And doing it. <laughs> right? That's what it's all about. Just faith of a little child. So that's the first thing we need. We need to have increased faith. And, and basically, the Lord is saying, you've already got it. 
And then we need to receive, once we've got that increased faith, he needs to receive our service. We need to do something with that increased faith. And for this, he tells us a parable in verses 7 through 10. Well, any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep, say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table. Will he not rather say to him, prepare the supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink? And afterwards, you can eat and drink. Basically, and afterwards, if there's anything left, you can go to your room and eat, you know, eat, eat and drink what you need to. Verse 9, does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that was commanded, that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. That's it, folks. We are unworthy servants. The mercy of Christ has gotten us here. All the little things that we're doing, that's not fancy. That's not to ride home. To, that's just what the Lord is expecting us to do. What this world needs, brethren, is they need to see Christ in action. And Christ is a servant. They need to observe us doing little things. Edgar Guest wrote a poem called, I'd Rather See a Sermon. And there's about 17 little items that he wrote with us. I've just got one or two up there. I'd rather see a sermon than year one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely till the way. The eyes are better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. The best of all the preachers are men who live their creed, for to see good put into action is what everyone needs. I can soon learn how to do it if you let me see it done. I can catch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. <laughs> and the lecture you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lesson by observing what you do. For I may understand you in the high advice you give, but there is no mistaking how you act and how you live. When I see an act of kindness, I am eager to be kind. When a weaker brother stumbles and a stronger stays behind, just to see if I can help him, then the wish grows strong in me to be as big and thoughtful as I know that friend to, me, to be. And all travelers can witness that the best of guides today is not the one that tells them, but the one who shows the way. The world needs <laughs> servants. The world needs people who will turn to God and say, God, give me greater faith. And then with that greater faith, actually goes and does it. Every Thursday, Bill and I, Bill Senior and I, drive out and we go and visit someone and we, we have a really good time. But, you know, I kept talking to Bill about the fact that the church needs a sign and it's not visible and eventually he got tired of it. <laughs> he just started to, to take care of it. That's what it's all about. Just, just do what you think needs to be done and, uh, and watch what happens. You see, the final point is, when we start to do that, when we've got just one child who says, I'm going to invite my friend, and by the way, Emlyn wasn't the only one uh, to, to invite a friend. Uh, I was pretty amazed at, at, uh, at uh, some other children that I know, uh, and I've talked about them, that did the same thing. And, and when we see these children, we see the faith in them, we say, we can do that. And sure enough, we can. But then God gets the glory. Look at verses 11 through 19. And look at Jesus with these lepers and see how he has 10 lepers and how through faith they are healed. Their faith, they are healed. And see how many and what, which one, a foreigner or a Jewish person, comes back and says thank you. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, 
Go and show yourselves to the priest. Now, every single Sunday we hear, we partake of the Lord's Supper, and, and, and we remember that Jesus had what on us? He had mercy on us, right? He does it every Sunday. And, and, and so he says to them, what I want you to do is go and show the priest. In our case, it's go and show the world what I've done for you. Show them how you've been cleansed. Verse 15. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus, giving thanks. Do you pick up what just happened there? Did you see what I saw? Look at verse 15 and 16 again. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, doing what? Praising God with a loud voice. Not only that, you only fall at the feet of a God. He knew something about Jesus that the Jews didn't know, that no one was getting. Verse 16, and he fell on his face. He proselytized himself. I mean, he, he, uh, uh, proskuneo, he just fell down. And he fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. That's pretty sad, right? Now, he was a Samaritan. The last person that you would have thought would actually get it, got it. The one person who had the faith got it. Verse 17, then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to them, he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. There is a river. It runs 4,400 miles. It's the largest river in the world. It's the River Nile. The pharaohs looked at that big river and they said, that's my river. I created it. I am the God of the Nile. You know, this, it belongs to me. Any glory that you want to give that, you give it to me. So God heard this. <clears throat> Sorry, and he says this in Ezekiel chapter 29, verses 3 and 9. My river is my own. This is what he says the Egyptians were boasting. My river is my own. I have made it for myself. And as a result, in verses 8 to 9, God punishes the nation of Egypt. <clears throat> Instead, we ought to know this. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, God says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. What has God done for us recently? We asked for faith, right? I mean, we really stepped out. <laughs> Uh, Billy was asking, how many people do you think? And I said, uh, 268, right? <laughs> and so, some, some of you answered it was ridiculous. You were stepping out in faith, right? And then God comes through. He does something really amazing in our lives. And, and, and that is because we take that faith and we turn it over into an action. We, we show Him service. And now what's the next step? What's the next step? He gets the glory. Every single family that was here, every single good thing that he's done for us recently, from before VBS, from the beginning of this year, when we said, just a little closer walk with thee, he gets the glory. But instead, what oftentimes happens is we get sidetracked. We cause each other to stumble. We say things that we ought not to say. We cold, pour cold water on things we ought not to pour cold water on. Because we forget who we really are. We are not important. We are just merely doing what is expected of us. We are servants. On Monday, I went to town and country. And you know that nice soccer field that they have? It's green all year, right? It seems like it's AstroTurf. And I walk in, and I've got in my mind, I'm going to swim a mile. That's my goal. I'm not an important person. I'm, I'm not the, somebody who works there. I'm not somebody who's uh, expected to oversee the property. And, and it's like the devil knows exactly what I'm thinking, and he's trying to sidetrack me. Because right off to the side, yeah, as I'm walking, is this man <laughs> playing golf on the AstroTurf. <laughs> it's not my problem. It's not my business. It's not that I don't care. That's not why I'm here. I'm here. 
I'm not the defender of the faith for this congregation. My role is not to judge everybody and to say, you're doing it wrong, you're not doing it right. My job is just to be busy. My job is to get my hands dirty and to put my head down and not to look at what my brother is doing over there. I might, if I finish my work here, start complaining there instead of saying, you know what, I finished here. There's some more stuff I need to, be, not need to do. There's always something needs to, do, to be done. God gives us, a, gives us the faith. We turn around and look for service. And then we say, to God be the glory. And he gets all the glory for everything we've done. So how do you become a servant? Even as we are preaching these lessons and saying these fancy words, somebody is busy drawing a little coloring ink thing, and you think they're not paying attention. And they're paying attention. Maybe getting more out of the lesson than all these big adults over here. And they're going to act in faith. Why don't we do the same? Let's ask God to give us the heart of a servant, to make us the people that he wants us to be. Maybe today is the time when you realize selfishness and pride doesn't belong in the kingdom, but only a humble heart. If you need to start that journey today by becoming a Christian, you can become a Christian by joining Christ on the cross, by being a living sacrifice, dying to yourself, being buried in the waters of baptism, and raising up to walk in your life. If you've forgotten what it is like to be a servant, then you've forgotten what it's like to have a relationship with God. You've forgotten what it's like to praise God, to give, to give Him the glory. Please come back to that way of living right now. As together we stand and sing.